happening, especially in this crazy year, that you could carve out two hours for this fills my heart with joy. Thank you. Well, you are not only an internationally known mystic and an author, and of course, you've written oh, over 30 books. So, you know, you, you know a thing or two. But I think it's... I hope so. <laughs> you think Who knows you, at this stage? You do. You absolutely do. And the thing that's so great, I think, too, <laughs> Andrew, that you admit that it wasn't easy. I mean, no. honestly, it, it wasn't easy you admit when you have your dark nights, and this happens in your 30s. This happens many, many times through the journey. Uh, but I want to rewind the clock for everybody. And yes, Karen, it is recording. I see that you sent me a question. I am recording. Um, I really wonder if you were five years old and you got a download. I just love this story because there's so many incredible mystical experiences that you yourself experienced and that you, still decades later, you were doubting everything. And at one point thinking of ending your life. I mean, it got really dark for you. Yes. Oh yes. But tell the story about when you were five and what happened to you when uh, you saw the yogi under the tree. I was born in India. And if you're born in India, as I was in 1952, you're born into a world that is deeply strange and mysterious and magical and filled with mystery. And as a child, I was astoundingly open and I loved going to Muslim tombs and I loved going with my father to the Taj Mahal and I was passionately in love with India. I was a relatively privileged child mm -hmm. and it took me a long time to really register the horror of the poverty of India. But when I did, it pierced my soul mm -hmm. and I really understood, my God, there are millions and millions and millions of people living in the most dreadful conditions in this world, mm -hmm. despite all of the holy truth that was also there. Mm -hmm. And one day I was walking by the river, the river Jamuna. I used to escape from home and walk up and down this strange and holy river, which had these amazing banks of white sand. And I saw a yogi. I didn't know it was a yogi, but I saw this beautiful old man just standing there in prayer with his face ecstatic with a light of joy that I'd never seen on a face. And I realized, oh my God, this man is seeing and feeling and being with God directly, nakedly. And at that moment, I made a prayer in my heart. I said, I want to be like that man before I die. I want to know like he knows. I want to be in as passionate a connection as he obviously is. And I went back to my mother and I said, I've just seen God on the river. And she said, what did God look like? My mother had a very ironic no, a sense of humor. And I said, he was naked and he wore these rags, but he was so beautiful. And she said, ah, you saw a yogi. And that was the first time I heard that word. Mm -hmm. And I think it changed my life, that memory, that meeting. And I can mm -hmm. see him now. One of the things that has always struck me as I go back to India again and again in my life is how many people in India still take that path, mm -hmm. still wander the Himalayas, still sleep in the back of temples at night. You meet, I've met the most incredible people on my travels. I've met retired business people, ex-bank managers who are now yogis just wandering, praying to be liberated in this life. So if you've never been to India, go, because it will fuel a wholly different level of devotion in you. You really see and feel and taste what passionate devotion for God is like. And we will go with you. 
<laughs> Next I year, uh, if, if trips are going, Andrew's always running trips. So go ahead, uh, Andrew. I'm along. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have, and, and never recover that. from it. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely make sure we get that. But then I want to talk. Okay, so then you go to Oxford, and I, there's this is such a great sentence, Andrew, that you say. You said, like many intellectuals, I was so drunk on my own intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You just thought you were all that. Oh, you I realized think I was the bee's knees. Yes. Right. Then what happened? How did you get kicked down to reality? You went back to India. <laughs> well, what happened was is that I won the big prize in English life. I was at 21, the youngest fellow ever elected to a college called All Souls College, which is a college that you don't, you can't get into unless you're chosen. So you have to sit an examination and they choose from the people who's sitting the examination, which ones they'll elect. And sometimes they don't elect anybody, but I was elected. And in one way, it was absolutely astounding because I got to live in a completely elite, magical, golden world, in a sense, because I was dining with prime ministers and archbishops and heads of companies and meeting the rich and powerful and glamorous of the world. But in another sense, it was absolutely devastating because meeting them depressed me terribly. And I realized that the world was in profound trouble if these people were ruling it. Mm -hmm. And my heart became battered and shattered. And fortunately, at the age of 25, I was able to return to India for nine years. I hadn't been there for nine months. I hadn't been there since I was 15. And I didn't go to India seeking anything. I went to India broken. And I went to India heart sick at what I saw was happening in the West, a complete dereliction of any kind of conscience, a complete orgy of greed, a mad pursuit of power. And already at that time, I realized that the West was headed for total disaster, the kind of total disaster that's now erupting everywhere. But I had no knowledge that I was on a religious search. I just wanted to go back and bathe in the shining waters of my childhood. But what happened was completely different. I went to a place called Pondicherry, I'd heard about the great Sri Aurobindo, the greatest evolutionary mystic humanity's ever known, who lived in the 20th century in this French town by the sea. And I met a great friend, someone whom I really adored. He was a French-Canadian poet and a mystic. I'd never met a real mystic before. And whenever I told him how miserable I was or how dreadful the world was or how that we were headed for total care, he would just laugh at me. He said, you just don't know who you really are. You don't know anything. Why don't you humble up and start looking, start searching, start yearning, start burning to be given some taste of real reality, not this fake intellectual nonsense that you've been wandering in, this desert of self-pride that you've been wandering in. Right. But what happened then was that I had a series of overwhelming mystical experiences, which just shattered me open and made me realize that although I could read German and Latin and all the great philosophers and had read everything, I knew nothing. I knew nothing about this real essential world that's always here. And that started me on a massive mystical search, which took me to the Himalayas, where I met a very great ancient Buddha person called Tukse Rinpoche in the magical Tibetan kingdom of Ladakh, just opened. I was one of the first people there. That took me to live in Paris, where I became involved with a group of Sufis and started translating Rumi. And that took me to the feet of someone who had become my guru, a young woman who was nine years younger than me, actually, Mother Mira. Mira. Mother Mira. My, she was 17 uh, years old. So here yes. you are, you know, so at that time you were, if she was nine years younger, you're 26. She's right. She, oh my goodness. And, and yet she had such grace and knowledge and wisdom as if she were 75. Yes, she did. She seemed to. Yes, she did. We had a long relationship which ended badly, but I'm very grateful for the relationship because it opened my soul. It opened my heart. It opened my sacred centers. And because of my longing to be 
initiated. I was initiated. And right. So for 15 years effect. you worked with Mother Mira, and it's interesting you say that it ended badly. I, this this brings up a question. Do you think that there's ever a time where we outgrow a guru? You know. Like, oh yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So talk I to think about that. that. The, well, in my case, it was a very dramatic break because she, I had met the man who was going to, I was going to marry and I was deeply in love. And she told me that there was no place for anybody gay in the queendom of the mother. And I looked at her and I said, are you kidding me? Wow. Are you absolutely kidding me? And I broke with her and I had to, because I was the chief disciple, I said, look, she said this, then she lied. And then my life was plunged into three years of horror and which I was denounced and humiliated and bombs were thrown through my window and my husband nearly died of cancer. And it was a horrific, horrific period. But I blessed that period for the following reason, because I think we're not in an age of gurus at the moment. We're in an age of the direct connection. Gurus and churches and religions are patriarchal. They tell you what to do. They have an image of what you're supposed to be. But there's something much more thrilling happening in humanity at the moment. And that is that people are being introduced to their own divine consciousness and matured in their own unique path to realize their own unique gifts because what's being born through the horror of this mega death that we're living through on every level mm -hmm. is a humanity that's free of the follies and the laws of the past, able to come together beyond religion in divine communion and in divine initiation. So how I look at my journey is that I needed to have a guru for a bit. I needed to believe that I had a guru and I needed to explore the depths of the Indian tradition into which I'd been born. And in a way, what I was doing, I was revenging myself on my imperial family by adoring this 18 year old Indian woman. Can you imagine what a scandal it was both for Oxford who thought I was completely mad and for my family to actually look at this guy who seemed to have everything, giving it up, but going to worship this young woman. So I'm glad I had the courage and the guts to do that because it plunged me into the depths of Indian mysticism. Mm -hmm. And when it broke, it liberated me to become my true self. And well, I that's, realized- That's your dark that night. Yes. That's, that's how you talk about, and for everybody out there who hasn't read Andrew's books, it, his work talks a lot about how you have to heal that shadow. The shadow is the part of you that needs to be tended to. I'm going to quote back to you, you, Andrew, you say, in order to be in the state of consciousness, you have to die in the state of full self. It is grueling and it nearly kills you. The divine has to surgically get down to the ego and the core of your life to save you. So think about that. How can you get that you know, face, you have to hit the dirt face down, you know, and, and, I, and I wonder sometimes, because I see some people that seem to have such blessed lives right you you think well they never have a bad day everything's going great for them that's not a blessed life no no <laughs> and it's also a blessed not life <laughs> is when you're crucified and resurrected a yeah. blessed life is not fame is not money is not what the world cherishes they die ignorant those people right and god doesn't bother with them god gives them what they think they want but when you come to the life in which you're going to taste liberation what happens is that all the karma of all of your previous incarnations starts to mature and you deal with ordeal after ordeal after ordeal after ordeal. And if you're very lucky, and this sounds very strange, if you're very lucky, God intervenes personally and gives you an impossible crisis to suffer through. And you don't survive that crisis. It's designed to kill your false self. There's a wonderful sacred saying by the prophet, peace be upon him, who um, not only was the instrument of the Quran, the revelation of the Quran, but God also spoke these amazing things to him and he gave them to the Sufis who followed them. And in this 
astounding saying, which is the key to our time. Mm -hmm. God says, when I find you sincere, I kill you personally. And because I'm killing you personally, I will pay the blood money myself. And what I will give you is myself. So when your time comes for your dark night, if you have this inner map, you know that however terrible the things that unfold are going to be, if you can only hang in there and stay in love with love, stay devoted, stay surrendered, however frightening and chaotic and insane things become, you will die into your vast you and be given a wholly new level of presence and power. And this has happened That's to me. Crazy. So I've lived through, it was a 10 year terrifying dark night in which I lost all my money. My husband nearly died. We were humiliated. We had bombs thrown through our window. Old friends betrayed us. We lived through every conceivable kind of agony. My back was out for most of that. So I was in extreme physical pain also. But I knew this secret because I had evolved enough to know this secret. And clinging to love enabled love to burn away and sear away the things in me that needed killing so that a wholly new kind of being could come and live in me and I could begin my work for the world, which is what I've been doing for the last 30 years, fueled by the energy of what happened when the dark night ended, and it did end, as it always ends, it ends with a tremendous vision of the beloved. That's in the classical texts. And in my own experience, I had a huge vision of the Christ. Yeah, tell, yeah. Me, not tell the gallery that's because that's important. Well, my father was dying in the place that I was born in Coimbatore, which is in South India. And I went back to be with him. We had an amazing week. And on the Sunday, I went to church and this little beautiful Indian man came out and gave a really extraordinary sermon. I was in a very heightened state because I was with my father, whom I adored, who was dying. So my heart was absolutely torn open. And he said in his sermon, he said, Jesus is the king, the mystical king of reality, not because of the miracles and all the rest of it, but because he gave everything to help others. And that seems like a very small phrase, but in the state that I was in, it pierced me like a sword and I started to sob because I realized, my God, what, what had exploded in Jesus was this passion overwhelming passion to serve everyone to love everyone and he was prepared to do anything anything even die like a rat on the cross to give that love to show that love to people and then as i was sobbing i looked up and i saw this statue of the resurrected christ at the end of this church and i'd been in that church as a child so it was a church i knew and that statue became alive. It was Jesus was there and the beloved was there. My beloved, I love all the religions. I honor all the religions, but from a child I've been in love with him. And I saw him and he was blazing with golden light and he was alive. And he turned to me, nobody else could see this obviously. And he turned to me and from his heart came this molten flow of lava it felt like a jet of golden lava coming towards me through the air and I opened my heart and an answering flow of lava came from me much smaller but there was just this overwhelming connection and love and passionate radiant love between me and him and Love, lover, and beloved became one ecstasy. It was an extreme experience, as you can imagine. I was standing in church next to my brother, who is a millionaire banker. So I, I was sobbing, and he said, what on earth is going through? And I said, I couldn't say Jesus is standing at the end of the church. It was not possible in my British family. So I said, oh, I'm feeling very moved or something. But then I went outside, and... 
the experience continued. And this is what birthed sacred activism in the world because I went outside and I saw this beautiful young man, totally derelict with no arms and no legs in a stinking puddle. He'd been placed there by someone because he, they knew that when people came out of church, he would have some money. And I went up to him and I gave him everything that I had and I gazed into his eyes and helped him out of the puddle and asked for people to take him and gave money to, for him to be taken to a place where he could rest. But as I looked into his eyes, I heard this thundering voice, which I knew was the voice of the Christ. It was like a voice of thunder. And it said, you've been playing with the light. You've just been playing. You've been given all the great teachings. And all you've done is decorate your ego with those teachings. Don't you realize that there are millions, billions of people suffering horribly like this man? And don't you realize the forests are burning, the seas are polluted. My world is being utterly, utterly destroyed. And I was shaken, as you can imagine, because although I knew this, to be told this by the divine and to be broken and flayed after being so opened was really terrifying. And then the voice continued and the voice said, look, at the end of this experience, you're not going to be asked how many books you've written. You're not going to be asked how many marvelous mystical experiences you've had. You're going to be asked one question and one question only. And the question is, what did you do while the world was burning? What did you do? What did you risk your life for? What did you stand up for? What did you protect? What did you honor? What did you do? And at that moment, I understood in every cell of my body that the experience I'd been given at the end of my dark night was to make me a warrior, a midwife warrior of a global movement of love in action, which I called sacred activism in honor of the Christ. But it's a movement that goes beyond religion and summons everybody to connect with their deepest spiritual self and then seeing the agony and the horror of what's happening in the world, dedicate themselves in whatever way that's natural to them and to their gifts to doing something real. So that experience was both a revelation and a tremendous bitch slap and a call to a mission that has been my mission ever since so that's that is incredible and what year was that bitch slap andrew 1998 98 so exactly you had success you had a lot of things and you even talk about that that you thought if you just had the commercial success in the west and you know then all this other stuff would fall if i just this then this if i just this then this if i everybody does this don't everybody they does. everybody tries to find love and truth in all the wrong places until they're checkmated and suddenly something they never imagined mm -hmm. is given them and, and so the, you I, say surrender and you say, uncle, I want to read your de uh, definition. One of your definitions of sacred activism is when you infuse the passion of a mystical consciousness with clear, wise focus and an urgent radical action, then a holy force is born. That's a very powerful statement. And then you had the dream about the two rivers. So tell the gallery about that. Well, I, as you can imagine, once if, you've, if you see the Christ, you spend many years meditating on what you've seen. And mm -hmm. when you have a major mystical experience, every detail of the experience is itself a revelation. So through the years I meditated, meditated, meditated on every detail of what had happened in that church, because I knew if I could unpack it through grace, I would be given the direction for my life. But, one evening, I was frustrated. I was feeling, I must know 
what this force that was bursting from your heart was. I know it's love. I know it was love. But it was m more than anything that I'd ever associated with love because it was such a huge, transformative, galvanizing, electrifying force. It was like a, a fire hose of the original force that created the universe. Mm -hmm. And that evening I had a vision, an op open-eyed vision. I don't have visions very often, but they're always cataclysmic and they're always visions that last me a lifetime. But this vision went to the core of sacred activism because I saw two rivers racing across a desert plain and meeting on the horizon. And when they met, there was this Hiroshima, but it wasn't a horrifying explosion. It was an explosion of different colored light forces. It was a new force was being born. And as I watched this, I heard the voice again of the Christ, I believe, of the beloved. And the voice said, when the river of the mystic's passion for God meets the river of the activist's passion for justice, a new force is born that can transform everything. Mm -hmm. And I also heard two other texts that I loved being sung. They were in music. And one was from Teilhard de Chardin. And he says, this is such a great text. If you haven't heard it, this will rock your world. He said, someday after we have harnessed after we have explored the depths of gravity we shall harness the energies of love and then for the second time we will have discovered fire and there was that fire on the horizon that was the fire of the christ we will have discovered fire this transformative fire of love in action that can change everything and I also heard the words of Rumi. I've been obsessed with Rumi for 40 years. I've been one of the translators who brought Rumi back. And Rumi has been an essential force in my life. And this poem means a great deal to me. It means everything to me because it says, passion burns down every branch of exhaustion. Passion is the supreme elixir and renews all things. So don't sigh heavily, your brow bleak with boredom and cynicism. Dare to look for passion, 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 passion. He repeats it five times. And then in the last two lines, he says, run far away, my friends, from all false solutions. Let divine passion triumph and rebirth you in yourself. And I realized from that tremendous vision that what sacred activism fundamentally is, is the birth of this radical revolutionary new force through the merging of the two noblest impulses in the human heart that have been kept apart by the patriarchy. The noble impulse of wanting to be one with eternal reality that is the guiding impulse of the mystic to know what's real, to love what's real, to be one with what's real. And the other noble impulse, which is the other noblest thing about human beings, the passion to see the poor fed, the animals respected, the world loved and cherished as a divine world. Mm -hmm. And what that vision made clear is that instead of separating the activist from the mystic, if you could unite them in one being, what would happen is that a new kind of human being empowered by God and blessed by God and guided by God would be born that could be an agent of profound transformative change. Mm -hmm. And then I looked, of course, at the 20th century and saw that there'd been beings like this who had arisen. Gandhi had arisen and had dissolved the British Empire. Martin Luther King had arisen to prevent a bloodbath. We'd seen Lech Valencia and Solidarność riding under the banner of the Black Madonna, dissolving the Russian Empire. We'd seen these beings who hadn't chosen not violence, but a non-violent path of burning love in action. And we'd seen them do miraculous things in extreme circumstances. So I realized then that 
the crisis that is now becoming terminal potentially we're living in a time of apocalypse of real terrifying crisis on every level and in every domain all happening at the same time i realized that that crisis could only be met by something as strong as it is the darkness is very powerful but there's an answering light that is potentially being borne by the pressure of this darkness and this answering light is sacred activism is the light that i saw in that church is this living experience of passion in the very depths of your cells the triumphs, let divine passion triumph, and rebirths you as a, what I call a warrior midwife mm -hmm. of the new humanity. You want to be a warrior, you have to have that strength, that power, that intense nobility of spirit and that capacity to endure because if you're going to fight for justice, you're going to get defeated again and again and again. But you also need the tenderness and cherishing and generosity and sweetness and compassion of the divine feminine that midwives and encourages people to birth this next level of human potential in themselves, a level which fuses together the deepest spirituality with clear, wise, guided action with others to prevent the extinction of the human race and to ensure the going of the human race to the next level of power and truth. You know, as I sit here and you talk, Andrew, it's a shame you're not more excited about this. <laughs> I know, I mean, I really should be. <laughs> Well, this, you're once, just so mellow. No, I've, I have loved it. The problem like, is that once you've seen it, it, <laughs> it's it totally changes. You're, once you cannot see the beloved. Well, you can't, un, you can't the put the toothpaste beloved. back in the tube. And that's, that's the right. beautiful part about your experiences. And, and all of them, too, what I think is so important is you talk about being drunk on your own intelligence. Well, there, yeah. are, there are some activists that are drunk on their own activism. And that is not the the well, energy that you're talking about. That is not at all, man, but if you look at it like this, let's look at it like this. Mm -hmm. Mystics as they are now have a big shadow too. Yes. Yes. They get drunk on the divine. They love their experiences. They drop the body. They drop their relationships. They go off into the light and they don't take seriously, many of them, the real horrible agony that the world and the animals and the nature are now in. Mm -hmm. Quite honestly, the world is burning potentially to death. And if mystics just go off into the light and don't care and don't mobilize that love that they're experiencing and use it to be effective in the world they're really collaborating with the death of the world mm -hmm. then you look at activists and you see how many activists although prompted by noble motives are very self-righteous have messiah complexes believe they know everything demonize their opponents and are horribly ineffective in getting their valuable messages across because their egos are so fractured once you see that, you can despair, but ah, there's a good news, which is in that vision. Because if you can imagine joining the very best of the mystic inside you, which is the passion for God, the passion for reality, with the very best of the activist, which is the passion for justice and the passion for truth, then the shadows both of the mystic as we have them now and the activist as we have them now are healed because the mystic knowledge and humility heals the activist insecurity and arrogance and the activist's focus heals the mystic's potential narcissism mm -hmm. so you have a new being who is in fierce dynamic balance Yes, which is radical regeneration, birthing the new human in the age of extinction. That's the name of Andrew's new book that you all need to get. Um, and you cannot again, live another day without this book. It would be terrible to even try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but here, t tell the gallery, Andrew, the story that you told me when um, when I got to see you this summer uh, of the a very mystical event that happened to you in Greece, because I told you that Greece is one of my favorite places as I, I've dabbled in it, but I- Oh, that, that was a lovely, funny, that was a- yeah. you, you, I, The Delphi story, yes. Yes, yes, please. 
What happened? Well, I love Greece. I used to go flee from Oxford to Greece in the holidays and roam around Greece on my own. And I found myself in Delphi, which is really the cradle of ancient Greek civilization and a very magical, mystical place. And it was Easter and I went to the Athena Pranaya, which is this temple to Athena, to the goddess of wisdom. And a beautiful old woman with her granddaughter turned up and they were actually collecting herbs in that place. And we had this magical meeting and conversation while the bells of Easter were ringing. I was 26, I think. And then I went back to Oxford and my habit was every Thursday to go into the library and read something I'd never read before. And I didn't know what I was going to read when I went into the library, because I find that you need to constantly shock yourself and tease yourself and seduce yourself into new areas. Of, I'd still go into bookshop and buy a book that I had no intention of buying just to compel me to embrace another reality that I hadn't been embracing before. And this time I picked up Shelley's letters, the great, the great mystical poet who died at 27, who was one of the great romantic poets. And I opened the book, he's in Delphi, it's Easter. There's an old woman with a daughter and they're picking herbs and they have a magical conversation. And I closed the book and I thought, oh my God, how? Absolutely. And it's strange, too, because my favorite poem as a child, as a young person, had been Shelley's Prometheus Unbound, which is a staggering poem about Prometheus who steals the fire from the divine to bring it to humanity, the real prophetic passion to transform humanity, which in a sense has been my, has been my passion. And I didn't think I was Shelley and that I was getting a sense of my previous reincarnation, but I knew that I'd been part of that group of beings who had been there at the beginning of the 19th century to help birth the first attempt at the birth of the human divine, which failed because culture went on this binge of industrial civilization and the strip mining of the earth. But I knew that I was part of that effort, that effort to bring sacred imagination to the world, to inspire human beings, to rise up in their innate glory and put an end to these systems of horror, of cold evil that we've become so addicted to. So that was a, an amazing. I love that. I love that. And you also spent a great deal of time with Father Bede. He, you talk of him as one of your greatest teachers. Oh, he changed everything for me. Yeah. Uh, tell the gallery about him a little bit if they're not familiar already. My dear friends, if you've never heard of a man called Father Bede Griffiths, this is your lucky day because Father Bede was the greatest Christian mystic of the 20th century with Thomas Merton. And he lived the majority of his life, the last 50 years of his life, in South India. And I had become a devotee of his work because his work is immensely broad. He remained a Christian, but he plunged deep into the mystical and recognized the essential unity of all the revelations. And I had adored his work. And one day I had a friend who was an Australian film director and I was living in Paris and he rang me up and he said, would you like to come and make a film about Father Bede. I was 41. Bede was in his 80s. So I said, would I like? I would rob Steve. I don't know what I wouldn't do to do this. And so I went to South India to the ashram, which Bede was in. I met Bede and I felt totally and hopelessly and finally spiritually, mystically in love with him. And we had an overwhelmingly beautiful and holy meeting in which he gave me two essential secrets which are at the heart of my book radical regeneration and i'd love to share them with you because quite honestly my darlings we are in a period of such horror and difficulty that if you don't have an inner map of what's happening you can feel completely paralyzed by what's happening so he gave me the map in 1993 and i've been following and understanding the depth of this map and uncovering it ever since so what happened was is that at the end of the last day of filming 
there was an Australian film crew who were very irreverent and I loved them and he loved them. I mean, they were real Australian guys and they hadn't come and I was in his small hut. And he said to me, um, Andrew, he had a very British English gentleman voice. He said, Andrew, you know that we are in the hour of God. And I, because I'm Oxford trained, I asked a snotty question. I said, and what do you mean? by the hour of God. And he said, I mean that if humanity doesn't choose adoration over power, humanity will end. And he looked at me and I felt this overwhelming grief and also, oh my God, he is speaking out of the depths of his prophetic knowledge. And I stayed silent, thank God. And then he said, there are three possibilities for the future. This is 1993. Just listen, because this is prophetic clairvoyance. He was a prophet in touch with the living Christ. And he spoke direct truth very humbly because he was an extremely humble. He was a saint. You don't meet saints very often. And he said, the first possibility is that humanity will realize just how dark and terrible its hubris is and fall on its knees and beg for transfiguration. And that won't happen. It's most unlikely. Are you kidding me? Of course, it's totally unlikely. The second possibility is that humanity, like an addict, will continue in its ruinous addiction and destroy nature and, and itself, a great deal of nature and itself. And he said, many, many days, I think this is the only possibility looking at the world as it is. And then he smiled. He gave this huge, beautiful smile. And he said, but that is not what I believe is going to happen. What I believe is going to happen is that humanity is going to be taken into a massive global dark night in which its full self is going to be systematically deranged, deconstructed, destroyed. And this will be an agonizing, horrifying process. And it will look like the end because everything will fail and fall down. All the old structures will be annihilated. And then he said, but it will not be the end. It will be the beginning. Because he said, the second coming of the force of divine love will not be a human being returning as a divine avatar. Jesus has already done that work. The second coming will be the rising of the golden yeast of divine love consciousness through an experience of extreme horror and tragedy in millions of people. It will be the birth of an embodied divine humanity out of the horror, the Phoenix of an embodied divine humanity will rise out of the smoldering ashes of the old human whose time has come because the old human consciousness is incapable of dealing with the tragedies and horrors that it's created. But it does, don't worry, it's going to be destroyed in a terrifying way, but out of the destruction will rise this new humanity. Mm. And then the next day, this, these were the two most astounding days of my life because the, the entire map was given in these two days to me and everything that I've lived and done since then has followed him, that revelation and everything has unfolded exactly as he said. So from that moment that he told me in that heart that we were going to go into the global dark night, I have known that the crisis that we're now in was going to happen. I've known it. It has consumed my heart with agony and heartbreak. I've cried out against it. I've tried to prevent it, but I've also known that it would happen and it was necessary. And in the next day, it was so extraordinary. I persuaded him to go to his little meditation hut, which was in the middle of a golden field near where his ashram was. And it's a broken down old hut with a broken down old bed. Nothing fancy, nothing Californian about Bede Griffiths. He was, an, 
he was a austere prophetic saint living a very simple life. And he lay back on that cot and his face lit up with unbelievable joy. And he then went and told me the great secret, which I'm about to tell you, and it is a great secret. It's the secret at the heart of all of the mystical traditions, especially at the heart of the Christian tradition. And what he told me was this. He said, about three years ago, I was close to death. I was attacked by a force, which was a kind of heart attack from the right side. And I prepared myself with the, the customary prayers to go into the night. I said my prayers to the angels, to the mother, to Jesus and everything. But that's not what happened. What happened is that instead of dying, I was absolutely possessed in a way that I'd never been possessed before by love. I was burning in this great furnace of love and I was crying out and Bede was an English gentleman, crying out was not his thing. He was crying out to the people around him. I'm being possessed by love. I'm being possessed by love. I'm being possessed by love. And then he said, and that incredible experience began a wholly new life. Because now the divine light is coming down through my Sahasrara, through the crown center, and it is illumining everything. It's going down into my heart, it's going down into my belly, it's going down into my genitals, it's going down into the cells of my body, and everything is turning to gold. Everything is being transfigured. He said this very humbly, because what he was telling me is what is known at the heart as I've discovered because I've been living this secret but also researching it and that's what radical regeneration is about is what's known at the heart of the great mystical traditions is that humanity is destined to be divinized the ultimate unfolding of our adventure on the earth is not to just be transformed and made into nicer, better, less cruel, less awful humans, which would be wonderful, let's face it, that would be a good start. But that's not the dream of God in ourselves. The dream of God is to engender and create an embodied divine humanity here on earth, capable of co-creating with the divine, a wholly new way of being and doing everything. And it was for that that Jesus really came, not to create a church, but to be the pioneer of this path, because Jesus was a sign that that divine humanity is possible. And he wanted to give the teachings and show the sign not to be worshipped as the unique son of God, but to show everybody else what they could be if they surrendered and abandoned themselves to this great love force that would transfigure them. So those two days changed my life because on the first day he gave me the map for what the world was going to go through and, and I knew it was a map forged in the truth of prophecy and on the second day he gave me the instruction about the birth that would take place through this terrible death that it wouldn't be the end but it would be the birth of divine love consciousness not just in the illumined mind not just in the sacred heart but in the depths of matter mm -hmm. jesus's last gift was not the crucifixion it was the resurrection transfigured matter and this process that he seeded and other mystics in other traditions have also known this this process that was seeded in us is a process that will take us to being divine in every part of ourselves. And the dark night that is now erupting in the world is not potentially the end of humanity, but the birth canal for this new species. So that's why I wrote Radical Regeneration which is with Carolyn Baker, which is the mature, the maturation of 30 years of exploration of this because i'm not writing it as somebody who just believes this i'm living it myself the fringes of it so i know it's true there's a great amazing unbelievable birth taking place 
in and through this exploding horror. And that's why I wrote the Didactical Regeneration so people could have the concentrated information that it would enable them to stay steady through what's about to explode <laughs> even more intensely. Staying steady is pretty hard these days. And as you mentioned, yeah. having a decade of darkness, you know, there are many people here I know they've had horrible loss and 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 even just in this gallery, not not mentioning even what's happening globally, but it can be very easy to get very micro about what's wrong, right? And, and think right. about just your immediate surroundings. And it's really hard to get global and to think about. But what you talk about so beautifully, Andrew, is the the community that comes from this kind of activism, right? With a consciousness and an activism with a purpose instead of with an ego, but there's a humility to it, but there's definite action. You talk about the Dalai Lama, you saw him get mad and yell. And it's like, wait, yeah. the Dalai Lama was yelling, but it was truth. He was speaking truth. It's okay to yell if it's truth to get people out of their ego, <laughs> right? Jesus yelled pretty effectively. He the tables, okay? <laughs> so yeah. So, but I'm saying for people who are having a real hard time right now with just emotional things and depression and, and and loss and and angst and loss of jobs and all the things that are happening with businesses going under how can we remind ourselves of the divinity that is out there like you talk about the beautiful light and i and i know then when father Bede ended up dying you went to see him when he was sick and then a few months later he passed and you were in california and you got a you got a sign from him and, and yeah. there really is no death because they're just in the next room it's a different yeah. plane but how can we remember this and and what wisdom can you give the group today to help us get back to that knowing it's so hard if we haven't seen Christ in a church ourselves, right? We go to church, we hope for that grace, we hope to feel it, we hope to get the goosebumps, but if we haven't had it, what can we do to try to attain it? The most important thing that anybody can do at this moment is to devote themselves to simple practice. Simple, simple practice. And the practice that I love to offer people is the practice that all the great evolutionary mystics who knew that we would come to this ordeal have told us is the most important of all practices. And it's my practice. It's the practice I use all the time. And it's called the practice of remembrance. And fundamentally, it is saying the name of God in the heart. Whatever religion you belong to, if, if you're a Muslim, you say, la ilaha illallah, there is no God but God. That's the Muslim prayer of remembrance. If you're a Buddhist, you say, om mani padme hum, hail to the lotus, the center of the heart. If you're a Christian, you could say, om nama Christaya," or you could say, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And I cannot begin to tell you how unbelievably powerful that very simple practice is. And begin by doing it for 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night, and then have it available for you throughout the day. So when you're threatened by despair or by chaos or by what's going on in the world, just say the name of God as you love God the most in your heart and extraordinary over time, extraordinary peace, extraordinary strength, extraordinary resilience will be born in you. And also you'll start receiving from love directly experiences which will show you that in your deepest nature, you are divine. I don't think anybody's been going to be able to get through this period without this kind of simple, humble, turning up in the middle of one's life, doing a practice that you can do in any circumstance. I say the name of God when I've got, I've just had hip surgery, so I've got this golden cane. And I love to walk to the, to get my food because it gives me half an hour to walk through Oak Park under my breath saying Om Namah Kristaya, Om Namah Kristaya, or Om Namah Shivaya, my favorite mantras. And I cannot begin to describe the power, the energy, the joy, the peace that comes. And it doesn't just come to people who've been graced with a lot of mystical experiences as I have been because I've had this job to do. It comes to everybody who does this. It is the clearest, simplest way. And the other way that's so important is to keep praying, 
keep praying for clarity, praying for strength, praying to understand why this huge, terrible process is happening. Don't waste the suffering and the grief and the, and the deep despair that comes because they're holy also and they're telling you something. They're telling you something about the attachments you need to let go of, the illusions that you need to let die, the nature of reality is impermanent. They're giving you great lessons. But the important thing is to be in a state of peace enough to be able to receive those lessons as grace and renovate your life through them. And the way to do that is to combine the saying of the name of God with a habit of prayer. And Carolyn Mace has just written a staggering book. Carolyn is a great friend of Jen's and mine and my soul sister. And she's written a wonderful book called Intimate Conversations with the Divine, in which she's really helping people to a new kind of prayer. When you're praying, don't be pious, don't be holy, don't feel you have to use grand words, just speak out of you to you. So if you're feeling, oh my God, I cannot see Trump's face one more time without wanting to take a hatchet and smash him down, which is not a good feeling, or that you cannot believe that American democracy will survive this rape and pillage that's going on, and you're frightened and you're worried about money and you're worried about not having food, just turn all that worry and anxiety into prayer. Turn it into speaking nakedly to God out of yourself, just as you are. And you'll find something amazing. It won't mean necessarily that suddenly you get $5,000 through the post. Right. That isn't how it works. What it will do is fortify you. It will give you perspectives you never knew you needed. It will give you strength you never knew you had. It will give you a fundamental calm so that whatever's thrown at you, you will have so much deeper inner resources to deal with it. Right. You know, you talk about get over your fantasy of being a good person. <laughs> yes, that's a very important fantasy to get over. Yeah. I have this if you're great... a good person, then you get all the good stuff. And again, then you're being an activist just to be a good person. It's like those well, nobody's you know, a, you know. goodness. We, we, Jesus said, didn't he, that um, my goodness is like rags before the goodness of God. So if Jesus is saying that his goodness is rags, mm -hmm. when you wake up, you realize that you've got every kind of darkness in yourself. And that is a very shaming recognition at first, but also a very healing one because it makes you love everybody, understand everybody. You, you get why they're so screwed up because you recognize how screwed up that part of yourself is. And from that flows compassion and skillful means of dealing with people. You know this, this is so wonderful. Well, in all of your travels and as you've had these mystical experiences, obviously giving you a piece that there is no death, it's really just a, a transference of energy. Um, tell the story about how you then went to, it was, wasn't it a psychic who was trained, uh, I think she was trained by Padre Pio and, and you got yeah. a from Father, uh, from bead and and it, here's the thing I, I interview a lot of people who have intuitive gifts I believe we of all are born intuitive this is our given gift everybody so has them everybody mm. has it we just don't bother to use that tuning fork like the way we should but right. share that story with the gallery because it to me it shows how our personality and our soul as we are here on the physical plane transfers into the spiritual plane doesn't it well there is no separation yeah those are even thinking that they're different is the mistake. We're living in God right now, like fish live in water. Everything is God. Right. And the, the whole point of life is to wake up to that and enjoy that amazing revelation to live the divine life simply. That's why we're here. That's why all the mystics of all the traditions tell us that. And it's true. But the it was an amazing experience because after B died, I was heartbroken. I mean, once you've met someone like him and being loved by someone like him, you really feel the whole universe is opening in a golden fan because there is the beloved. There is somebody who is the living Christ going through this transfiguration experience. But he died and I was heartbroken and I was in actually the place where I'd met him first, which was in California. 
and I went down to the sea in a state and suddenly the sun rose and this finger of golden light came across the water and I heard Bede's voice and he said, Andrew, don't exaggerate. She said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be with you always. And then eight months later, I was in Paris and <laughs> I was on the phone with an amazing clairvoyant who was trained by Padre Pio. She was a Romanian gypsy <laughs> and she'd met Padre Pio at the end of his life and Padre Pio had taken her into his wing and given her a great deal of his charism when he left. And she said, Andrew, there's something very strange going on in your room in Paris right now. And there is a man in what looks like orange curtains. Bede wore the orange robes of Sanyasi. He's old and he's smiling and he's very beautiful. And he has a message for you. I said, well, what is this message? And he says, what happened by the sea is more than illusion. And it was such a funny thing to say because the film company that made the film that I was part of about his life was called More Than Illusion Films. And so he was saying to me, what you experienced of my presence beyond death by the sea in California was not an illusion, it's reality. The saints never die. Those who have awoken in this life are deathless and they can accompany you and help you and protect you. And I have to tell you that he isn't dead for me at all. He's more alive now than he's ever been. And I've been working in him and with him and with his help and with his grace in so, 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 so many ways. I never spend a day without turning to him. He's on my, he's the first thing I see when I wake up because I have a photograph of him on my wall. But it's much more than that. It's a sense of being filled with this grace of someone who was the Christ is the Christ, is now one with the Christ, with love eternal, and is able to guide and help and inspire me in ways that I know I couldn't possibly be helped and inspired myself. It's an amazing revelation, but it's open to everyone. The great ones aren't dead. The Buddhas and the, the liberated of all the religions, they're not dead. They, they are part of a loving army of wisdom that is showering the human race with grace at this moment at its darkest hour. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who works with angels and who speaks with angels and she's truly the real deal. There are a lot of people who aren't, but she's the real deal. She's very humble, very simple. She lives very privately. She doesn't charge. She helps people in the most amazing ways. And I've experienced the angels with her. And she says, you cannot imagine what the angels tell me all the time. They say, we feel so underemployed. Here we are. We're dying to help. We want to help everybody. We know how desperate the situation is. We know what we could do, but nobody turns to us. Nobody asks us. So what my parting message to you is, believe in the eternal light. Believe you are the child of the eternal light. Believe that what is happening in the world is not a final horror, but potentially the birth of a new you. Do serious practice tenderly and with faith and humbly, and you'll see that you'll be guided through this chaos. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to just end with something I've been working on this afternoon. I'm working on a new book, and it's a book about that. Well, this is so exciting. She, her name is Hadovich of Antwerp, which is a hell of a name. <laughs> and she lived in the 13th century, and she was a Beguine, and she was a stupendous mystic, the grandest, fiercest, wildest, most lacerating, most naked of mystics. I mean, the, to my mind, the greatest of the female mystics in Christianity, which is saying something when you have Teresa of Avila and Angela Foligno and Mechtil, all the amazing beings. But Hadovich has always been an obsession of mine. And I've got together the major texts now and I'm getting them together in a book. But this afternoon I, I translated this from her and this is for us now. It's so powerful. So from Hadovich to me, to you, from, with Bede's blessing, here it is. It is a great and beautiful work to be strong and invincible, 
to give everything you can give, to live what the day brings, to accept the necessary willingly, to only desire the will of God, whether it makes you rich or poor, low or high, or puts your soul in despair and pain. Stay always active, stay vigilant, fear no effort, never crumble, and you will know already here on earth what God eternally will be for you in heaven. That's a call to arms for all of us in this tragic time. Trust your divine self. Fortify your divine self by prayer. Love the hell and heaven out of everybody. <laughs> Give your gifts with abandon and generosity. Ask for protection. Ask to be guided. And you'll be able to live the divine life on earth. To know your divine, to know your life is divine, to know the people you meet are divine. And whatever the hell or heaven happens, you will have realized the truth of your incarnation. Oh, is that beautiful? I love that. You know, the, um, somebody has a question. Um, let's see. Go ahead, Karen. What was your question? Oh, you know, thank you for this night, Jen, and thank you, Andrew. It's so nice to meet you. Nice I did have a question, you, but when you when you mentioned uh, Delphi, Jen and I were there a year ago, May. Yes. And all I know is when we walked into that temple, I was I had to stop and sit. I was so emotionally moved, yeah. and I just wanted to be. We were socializing. And I thought, you know what? I have to just be present with whatever yeah. I'm feeling right now, and I had to stop and be with it. And then we were by where the oracle was, I think is where it was. Where the Yes, it's very close. It's just to the left, yes. So, yeah, uh, you know, and that was very powerful uh, being there. Go ahead, Karen, I don't want to interrupt. Yeah, and that was it. And then the second thing to go with that before I let you, you know, is um, what you're talking about is everything kind of crashing and burning. I, I go to the Morton Arboretum a lot, which is, you know, beautiful greens. And this fall, they did a very specifically controlled burn on different areas in the forest and very strategically just burned it in, in many ways to protect the other areas, didn't let it go back into the earth. And it was just there again, I had to be present with that to just kind of observe uh, the cycle of nature and the cycle of the world. So anything that comes from those things kind of hit me as you were talking. Well, that's true. And I mean, when you sit back and realize how dangerous we are as a human race now, we're dangerous to ourselves. Two billion people are living on less than a dollar a day while this disgusting capitalist nonsense explodes. We create systems in which gay people and black people and the majority of women on the planet are still kept in states of deep, deep depreciation. We're killing a million species of animals. The, a million species are standing on the brink of extinction. We're raping and destroying whole swaths of nature. We're polluting the seas and killing the fish. What chance, what option does the divine have except one that will either wipe us off the face of the earth or transform us into guardians and protectors? Right. And so here, I love, what, I love what you said about the angels, that they are just anxious to hop in. They just need to be asked. <laughs> they need to yes, be invited. We talk about this all the time is the, um, uh, one of the people from the social club, Susan Rowland, talks about getting runners. There are angels that are, that are taskmasters, right? So I've kind of made this a little game. And I share this with the gallery that the other day I had, a, I had an earring that was stuck in the drain and I, I couldn't get it out for days. And so I finally, uh, we had a conversation with Susan. She reminded the gallery about the runners. And so I said, all right, I need a runner up there that was a plumber, please. <laughs> I'm kidding. I need someone with some crazy skills with copper wire to just take over my hands and help me get this because it was actually had a diamond in it, this earring. Right. And I, you know, it was, it was precious to you. Yeah. It was, it was sentimental and all these things. I am not kidding, Andrew, when I say that I suddenly just had the my arm went in a certain way and I pulled that sucker out in about 
15 seconds. <laughs> it was beautiful. So I, I encourage everybody here in the gallery, hire a runner slash angel with a certain mad skill because they're all there. And that brings us to- That's being, true. It's, uh, it's unbelievable what happens when you believe. When you believe and you trust yeah. it and you give up that power. And so as people become sacred activists, I want to encourage everybody in this gallery to become a sacred activist. Yeah. We all have different skill sets. Some people are yeah. great at QuickBooks. Some people are great at, at communicating, just going up to strangers of course with your mask on some people are you know whatever it is well what could be more important than eat and food right. I mean, to to create a magical atmosphere around food and to bring people together with the beauty of companionship food is, look at jesus jesus hung out most of the time eating and drinking with people because of the sacred importance of food right so, there's many, many different forms of sacred activism. It's fundamentally doing everything you do with tremendous spiritual exuberance mm -hmm. and really wanting to help people enter deeply into the magic and joy of life. So whatever gifts you have that help you help that. It's also turning up to support the major political movements. It's everything, but don't make it too narrow. It's got so many different aspects. Well, when you were in your 20s and you were, I, I feel like there's a story here and I was taking so many notes over the last couple of weeks, but you had a, a you were in a monastery and you're going to leave and then something happened to you. What what changed your mind? Do you remember? Do no, you remember I don't that? remember that story. <laughs> you don't remember? Okay, let's see. Um, what was it? Gosh, because I've reread your books over the last few weeks and I'm trying to remember that you really felt like you got a direct download and an aid from God. I mean, you had so many of these mystical experiences where the downloads came for you. Um, as anybody in the gallery has a question, please go ahead and, and throw it out there. Type it into the chat if anything's coming to you. Anything? What's What's heard. been arising in your hearts as I've been speaking? I'd love to hear from you because Absolutely. I've been pretty naked about my life. Yeah, and I love that Karen, Karen, so Karen shared that. I'm sure story. there are lots of people who are listening who really have had amazing intuitions themselves who know mm -hmm. a lot of what I'm saying is real. And how do you deal with it? How are you dealing with your lives now? Yeah. One more thought, Jen, one more thought before we move on mm -hmm. is with everything you've been saying and, and with that presidential election before this one when Trump got in, I my first thought, or maybe it was verified by somebody else, is he could end up being one of our greatest spiritual teachers because it gave us all a nudge that we have to do our part. It's time to step up and do our job, whatever that job was, to bring love into the world, to bring the light, bring the love. We can't count on the government to bring it to our door. We can't find the president's going to fix it. It's like, what, what do we do to flip on our light and to share that light with the world and love? So for me, that's the way I started to look at it to... Uh, to get I out think of my that's way. very wise. I think it's not just that, is it? I think he's a very great teacher because he is the crystallization of all of the most appalling American shadows, all of the shadows that have devastated American history. When you really meditate on American history, there have been three great genocides, the genocide of the Native Americans, the genocide that was slavery and the genocide of nature that happened in the 19th and 20th centuries as we, as America went on this long orgy of industrial greatness. And all those genocides have never been faced, have never, all those shadows have never mm -hmm. ever been truly healed. And when you add to that, what has disfigured American life, the cult mm -hmm. of money, the cult of power, the cult of celebrity, the rabid, rabid lack of conscience that is basically the fundamental rule of business. Business is business. You rape and pillage, do what the hell you want. All that matters is that you win. All of these horrible shadows have become crystallized in this person who's giving all of America a PhD in the American shadow waking America the hell up to how dangerous it will be if America continues on this path of conscienceless addiction to power that doesn't recognize the agony that that power has exacted, the agony that it's built on. On the other hand, 
what you're saying is also right, is because having seen that, so many people, and I know so many people are going through tremendous painful self-reckonings and letting their illusions go and really deciding to become sacred activists themselves. So a real democracy can be born out of this fake democracy that is now so obviously corrupt and cruel. Mm -hmm. And that's thrilling. Whether it will get through, we don't know. But the fact is that there are millions of Americans now who have seen how fragile democracy is, who've seen how dangerous these shadows are, and who are willing, it seems, to go through the process that could heal these shadows and build a new way of doing things. This is, I hope, what Biden and Harris will move with. And there's every sign that they're going to do their very best to do so. And there are amazing people available. When you think of the people in power, potentially with them, who are wise people, steady people, people who've been through very difficult situations. And you think about Biden himself. He's a man of God. He's a kind man. He's a man of empathy. He's a man who truly wants to, every American to be well, including the ones who didn't vote for him. We have the possibility of a new beginning, but we've got to go for it because there are tremendous forces ranged against it. You know, this, speaking of, of anger, that a lot of people have had a lot of anger until we can get some clarity on so many things going on. You talk about how anger can be so disruptive. I think about how people, they worship Jesus and they're so angry at other religions. And so how angry do you think Jesus is that we've really messed up his message? <laughs> he's obviously I not. Jesus, <laughs> I think Jesus has pretty much had it with Christianity actually. <laughs> he's appearing to everybody outside. No, obviously. Look, yeah. if you believe as I do that Jesus came to start a path, not a religion, then the starting of the religion was the original sin because it was organized by the boys club. It became body hating, sex hating and excluded women, all of which was totally foreign to his path. So the betrayal of Jesus began early. And I think being Jesus, he probably knew that that would happen. Right. But the Jesus force, the Jesus power, the Jesus revelation will never die because Jesus is Jesus. Jesus is the pioneer of divine humanity beyond religion, beyond dogma. And anyone who comes to love him and meet him in the heart will know who he is and know that he is living inside them as their own deepest, most radiant, bravest potential. So when we were at the Oracle of Delphi, and we we're talking about walking up the sacred path. So for those who don't know, the Oracle of Delphi in, uh, in, in Greece is where the priestesses, they used to, they would inhale these fumes and they were, they were considered old. They're probably 50, right? Ancient, but they were, they would inhale these fumes and get messages and, and get these downloads. And people would come for miles to ask for everything from, should I go to war to, will I marry Jimmy, whatever it was. And they would ask they were very important questions. Right, very important questions. And they would give a gift at the altar. And so if they were a farmer, they would bring a goat. If they were a warrior, yeah. they would bring a sword. So whatever it was, as I was walking up that path on the Oracle of Delphi, I just kept saying, thank you. Thank you. With each walk, I just felt like so many people, the vibration of that path, Andrew, yes. had such anticipation and intensity. And it was so powerful. I got goosebumps the whole time. And as I was walking and saying, thank you, I heard, thank you. And I was like, who just said that? It was like, oh, thank you. And I thought, oh, okay. So I get to the, the little ramp, which they believe is where people would wait for the priest to come, get your question, and then take it to the priestess. For once, the woman was the one in charge, right? The yes. priestess. And so I was standing there and I was waiting and I was just kind of praying etherically because you're supposed to you know, leave a gift and, and give your prayer. And... There was a group behind me and they were evangelicals and you know they were evangelicals that were saying while they do not know jesus the way we know jesus we can still forgive them i mean it was like they were ruining my moment with their loud they're not as good as we are prayer but the, that, the prop, this the evangelicals do have something and that's important to remember because they do have an overwhelming passion for jesus it's not our jesus it's a 
crazy version, but there's deep passion there. And there's, God knows if they can change. I don't know whether they can change now because they box themselves in so deeply. Mm -hmm. But who knows what can happen from that degree of passion. I'm, I lived in Arkansas in a broken down little hut for one of my periodic fits of bankruptcy. And I was surrounded by evangelicals. And at first I thought, oh my God, they're going to think I'm extremely strange. But I decided I'm going to love these people. I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to really find what is between us. And it happened in the first conversation because I went into a shop. There was an old evangelical lady who started to talk to me about Jesus. And I said, I absolutely love Jesus. And I said, I, and I gave the reasons why I love Jesus. And she and I had the most ecstatic friendship because we met in our love for Jesus. I didn't go into what, what I felt Jesus was trying to say or do, but I, we met there. You have to find with anybody you meet a place to meet. And this is going to become so important between the Democrats and the Republicans because they're now so divided, everybody's screaming at each other. But as somebody who's to the left of center myself, when I meet a Republican, I want to honor the things that are really honorable in Republicanism before Trump who's destroyed it, but the, the, the decency, the sense of self-reliance, the passion for freedom, the nobility of service, the deep love of country, the sense of tradition. These are not small things. These are holy things. These are powerful, beautiful things. They can be betrayed, they can be destroyed. But I've always found that if I made that first effort and really expressed my deep, deep respect for something in the other side's deep vision, that opens up unbelievable, that opens up friendship. And friendship is the only way that we can ever change anyone else's opinions. And uh, not just that, but you don't go into the friendship because you want to change the other person's opinions. You go into the friendship because you're delighted by the other person. And out of that delight, one day there'll come a conversation in which you're able to say spontaneously something that will really shift the other, or they will be able to say something spontaneously that will be able to shift you. All change, real change, happens because people surrender being right for depth of love of others, for depth of respect of others. You don't surrender what you know or what you feel, but you surrender your self-righteousness so that you can truly, truly approach another person with the respect that the divinity in them demands. Does that make sense to you? Oh, yes, that makes perfect sense. And that um, somebody had a question and you just answered the question with that answer. So that's perfect. And it brings me to think of a question because I've had to put up some serious boundaries with certain people, um, toxic people who are not working on themselves. Oh, yes. As we approach what's happening right now, and I was saying this before we recorded, what is happening astrologically at this time, and we're recording this here in December of 2020, this is December 20th of 2020, this day in particular is very sacred as we lead into the 20th and the 21st, the energy of where the planets are placed according to some astrological experts. Now this has not happened in 12,000 years. 12,000, you know, some people are like, oh, it's been 200 years or 300, 12,000 is a pretty big number. And so what's yes. happening right yes. now, yes. yeah, that's ridiculous. And so the, the planets will literally shake the earth tomorrow on the 21st. But what they're saying from a positive standpoint, we're having a cosmic upgrade and this upgrade is so powerful. So today and tomorrow, and that's why it's so wonderful that we're all here together with this intention of raising the vibration of everybody in this gallery, raising the vibration of anyone who watches this video at another date, but also in our immediate circles, our family, our kids, our loved ones, this raising of our immediate vibration, what's gonna happen is also, and this started on December 9th, this energetic shift, is the people who are not raising their vibration or working on themselves are going to go away. They are probably going to stay exactly where they are. And when you go up and they stay where they are, it's like a note, it's gonna sound horrible if that key doesn't move up or down. So we have to remember, it's not personal. It's just that they're not doing the human homework that we are doing, but it still hurts. So I, I guess from your perspective, Andrew, 
what do you say to those who are putting up boundaries, who are evolving, but the people in their immediate circle or maybe not immediate circle, maybe just family, whatever it is, aren't doing the work either. It feels so hard to make that shift, but sometimes it's absolutely necessary, isn't it? Well, I think you have to make the shift for love itself. You have to be brave enough to do the work, but you also need to practice profound compassion because not everybody's capable of doing this work and not everybody's been given the right teachings or the right methods to really realize themselves. And many, many people are so traumatized that they cannot get out of their narcissism. Mm -hmm. And having compassion while protecting yourself is very important. And also I would say, don't underestimate the force of prayer because very often you can't change people directly and you shouldn't try because it will create resistance. But if you bring them up in prayer, if you really ask the divine to start infusing them with a higher knowledge and a deeper love and more courage and more you will over time see remarkable shifts in their life which they'll never know that you've been part of so never underestimate the power of holding someone who's doing crazy stuff in your heart and praying deeply for their liberation and their awakening it's a very deep tool and when you discover how powerful it is it prevents you from growing hysterical at the madness that is inevitable in a time like this mm -hmm. well i want to share with the gallery some of your forms of service because you talk about i know in your book right out of the gate you give 10 but i've got five here that we can share with the group if you're yes. okay with that andrew but first is everybody can do this you can all be a sacred activist but the everybody, first, yeah the first step is to be able to serve the divine reality so you just commit to loving it totally and in whatever form you love it it doesn't matter whether you're a christian or a hindu god does not Mm -hmm. any religion <laughs> exactly and then second is being someone who prepares yourself to be this agent of change yes so that your heart your body your prayer do your shadow work that means doing the human homework that means looking at that inner yes. child that was abandoned you know this is important inner work and it sometimes is like pushing on a bruise but you don't have to yes. dwell on it just acknowledge it so that you can get past it right absolutely okay number three service to all sentient beings okay yes, everything so yes. you, you know how do you treat the waiter and how do you treat your dog and exactly. you know yeah. especially well in my case my cat is my <laughs> ultimate index is whether i'm in a, awake that day because if i'm not in a state of absolute adoration i'm failing yeah right exactly number four we have be aware of the great death and birth that is taking place so this is do something local what causes spark inspiration in you what are you yeah. you know do you have a soup kitchen nearby that needs your help and assistance you know they said to me the other day well we can't we can't take volunteers right now because of covid so i went through my my cupboard and anything that i haven't eaten in six months that's just been sitting there that i was hoarding for whatever reason because i thought i wasn't going to be able to go to the grocery store again i just put in a bag and dropped off and you know There's so much that we can do right now i mean people are suffering horribly people are in danger of being evicted people don't have food one in eight children are going without food this is outrageous in the richest country in the world but it shows the cruelty mm -hmm. at the core of so much of american politics for so long this is such a cruel culture not to have health care available for people this is insane in a country that spends a hundred million dollars on each bloody bomber not to be able to give health care in a major pandemic to everybody and not to have passed an absolutely gorgeous bill which gives people money not to work this is absolute they're still dithering about it right now yeah. when we're in the third wave mm -hmm. my god yeah. but if you rise up and say what you were saying, Karen, okay, it's my responsibility. Give the food, choose a, poor, a, a, a part of what I'll tell you what I do, and this might help you. Look, if you want to find out what you're called to do in this horrific crisis, dare to ask yourself one question. And it's a simple question. But if you ask it and really ask it, you'll find out. 
The question is, what of all of the stuff that's going on breaks my heart the most? What really breaks my heart? What can I hardly bear to think about going on out there right now? And I have friends for whom their heartbreak is the way in which we're just using the healthcare workers, driving them to exhaustion, not honoring them, not making sure that they're properly paid, not giving them leave. And she has become an advocate for the healthcare workers. And she is collecting money so that they can rest, take a day off, have real help. If your heartbreak is like mine, my heartbreak in this situation is the homeless. I live in Chicago. It's winter. I know what cold is like, like every Chicagoan, but I see my buddies, my homeless buddies shivering out there in the cold. So I have decided to take care of four of my homeless buddies every day to go and see that they've got food, to see that they have shelter, to see that they have somebody in this world who says, I love you, I care about you. And it's amazing how close we've become. They, they rely on me, but I rely on them. So choose some things. Don't just sit there with your resources. Do something wonderful. Not only will you feel so much more joyful, but you will also feel the power that is in you to make a difference. I saw on TV a couple of days ago, this seven-year-old girl. She was a seven-year-old Latina girl. And she decided that she was going to feed everybody in her, in her district. Mm -hmm. So she went around from school to school to school saying, look, we've got to give up a meal a day and we've got to put it all together and we'll all do something. You draw, you dance, we'll collect the money. Well, to cut a long story short, she got $10,000 together, which means that the people in her immediate area will go into Christmas with food on their table, a seven-year-old Latina girl with chutzpah. Mm. So what? Find your chutzpah. <laughs> That's perfect. Find your chutzpah. Okay, what other daily practices do you do, Andrew, other than saying God when you walk to go get your food so that everybody, and then I want to have everybody share one thing that they do to help raise their vibration before we let everyone go, since nobody's jumping in with any other questions. Everybody well, if there are other questions, I'd love to hear yes, them. Yes, we'd Just love to questions. hear them. So please, please take share a deep them. Breath. Take, a take deep a deep breath. breath. Think of a question. And then. I've been pouring myself out. I've given you what I believe to be the map. I've, been, I've given you the vision that I was given that has kept me alive. What, what's arising in your heart minds? I'm here, okay. let's talk to Take each advantage other. of this, please people, and ask your question, but go ahead, Andrew, and give us another, what um, daily practice of yours that you let, do. Let, let's give them a, a second or two. Let's give them a second. Or two. Nobody's talking. Everybody is just absorbing and giving me thumbs up, loving this conversation. Thank you so much. I got a question. Okay, Andy. Great. Andy, hooray. Thank hooray. You. Um, so I'm, I'm friends with a lot of people and they're Christian people. They're, are they Catholics? No, I'm a Catholic, and uh, but they're Protestant mainly. I know a couple of evangelicals. How do I, how, how are we supposed to take these people back? I think they've, they've gone to the edge of how bad they could be. And they, you know, at the same time, they're saying, you know, how, how much they love Jesus. What do we do? How do we, how do we bring them back into the fold? How, how do you think, Andy? What do you think when you, are, when you ask that question, what are you feeling in your heart? I, 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 I think about it, but I look, some of these people I like very much. So I just, I don't get into that conversation because I don't want to get into a fight. I hear you. I, there are two ways and two ways only in, in my experience. The first is to pray deeply, as I suggested, to pray for them, to really ask the divine to heal their hearts, to reveal the truth. And the second is the most exhausting of all, which is instead of arguing with people, one has to become more like Jesus oneself and radiate so much love and compassion and help and joy that they become in contaminated gorgeously by your presence 
you so know, go deeper. You find it hard to, to turn the other cheek sometimes. And 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 I, I, I'm thinking of one friend in particular who who's uh, a quadriplegic and who's who, you know broke his neck you know back in '77. Right. He was my, my best friend still is, right. but he is just he's gone so far to the right. He doesn't you know he's just and I'm just like. These people hate you. Why? Why do you? Why are you supporting them? You know, they want you to die, basically. But that's uh, why you're supporting them because you know that's insanity. You're, a, I know you. I mean, I love you. You're a wonderfully, I find you a very loving and very open being. That's why you're not abandoning them. They may have gone into this hatred business, but that's the time when we need to be they're in solidarity with their deep souls just in case they do have a chance to wake up and they may not but you're doing exactly the right thing in continuing to love them and continuing to honor your friendship and continuing to turn up with grace and warmth and cooking to give them a sense it gets, of it gets of harder it gets harder it gets very hard, but don't you think that's meant to get hard for the real christian or the real well, nothing nothing's Christian. supposed to be easy you know. None of, no, I, because if if love doesn't cost something, then it, it never gets to its depths. You can love your quadriplegic friend in his craziness and in this right wing madness. And you can also, I'm sure from your with your wisdom, you can understand why he might need this kind of crazy structure being so demolished himself. So you can get the connections between his physical dereliction and this kind of mad structure that he's addicted to. And all of that doesn't prevent you from loving what you've always known to be good and noble and generous in him. Otherwise, you'd never have loved him in the first place. So you're loving him is keeping alive potentially those qualities in him. You're honoring them. That's all you can do, but that's a lot. That's a huge effort of the spirit. Right. Does, that, right. does yeah. that make sense to you? Yeah, it does make sense to me. It's lonely, mm -hmm. but love is lonely. Yeah, love is lonely. Kim has a question. Kim, go ahead, say hello. Kim. You're you muted, sweetie. You're still muted. So great question, though. Wow. Yeah. These are all the questions we're dealing with. Yep. Okay. Um, Kim. Andy. Hi, Andrew. This Lovely is, to see you, darling. This is amazing. I I I can't thank you enough. Um, my pleasure. My um, honor. Um, I have a question about. Uh, you spoke early tonight about the the death of the, the small self, you know, that ego part of ourself. And you talk about the dark night. I'm uh, in one of those periods. Um, my, my, um, my oldest, my only boy, my uh, son passed away nine and a half months ago. Was, oh, was darling. Oh, my darling. And, um, and then, uh, you know, some, it's, it's interesting what I want to, it is. How old was he? He was 40 oh. and it's, it's, it's been especially hard, of course, because in this time of COVID, he passed on March 8th, right when everything was shut down with COVID. Right. And so being unable to grieve, to be, oh. to engage in the rituals and the healing and even normalizing, it's, it's, it's like, um, it's a period of prolonged, you know, rumination of grief. You're stuck in it. And, and I'm also, I'm, um, a caregiver to my husband who has a neurodegenerative brain disease and dementia. Oh so God, yeah. being a little bit of him every day. And then the, my son has, you know, three small children. So, um, you know, it isn't just my grief or grieving for my son losing half of his life here, but my, my grandchildren, anyhow. So I just say all that as, you know, this this dark desert that I'm in right now, right. and I know, I know that these are pathways and opportunities for <laughs> spiritual growth. I know that, and I've been through, I've been through nothing to this degree. Um, but it was interesting when you were talking about this and this whole process. I don't know if I have a question, and I just want to kind of share with you, get some absolutely kind of feedback and, and response from you. I know too that. Um, all of these things that you talk about doing, 
you know, we do. I've, I've battled with God, you know, not understanding why we must suffer in order to, to grow the role of suffering. And yes, yes, God, you, you gave us your only begotten son. And so you understand, but you knew he was coming back. You know, I'm a mere human. I, I have, it's not a threshold where I say I believe and then it's a done deal. It's, it's a constant surrender and a choice and That's a practice. It. And um, so I've, I've done my battle, you know, what my questioning of God. I know also I cannot dictate what the outcome will be. No. I, I don't know how, where he wants me to end up. I don't know what purpose he wants this to serve. I can't, I can't dictate that. And so um, I'm, at a, I'm at a point, it's interesting, just a few days ago, actually, I reached a point where I felt an acceptance. And I felt an openness. I'm, I'm like at this point again, I've been at this point numerous times, several times in my life, this openness to where he leads me. And that's why I'm so excited to hear you when Jen announced you and I, I ordered your book and I've started it. It's marvelous. You're, you're fascinating. So I'm on, I'm on this journey. I'm open to where he's leading me. I don't understand the role of suffering, but I'm open to where he takes me. For instance, you, you talked about the evangelicals. I've got like Georgia cousins, Bobby, Kenny, Davy, Denny, and Ricky. You know my my, and they are, um, they are they are good Georgia boys, and good people. And uh, one of one of them has um, a son-in-law who's a Baptist preacher, and I'm I'm going to be talking to him as soon as he recovers from COVID. Uh, I'll be talking to him, you know. Um, just hearing what he's, you know, I'm just open to where God, to all these, these various experiences, but um, the death, the death of the small self, you know, it's this ego. Um, well, I think you're living it because you've been put through very severe ordeals. You haven't given up on faith and you're surrendering more and more and more to something that you acknowledge is a mystery, something you can't control, something that's governed by laws you don't and never will understand. So you have three things ahead to really devote yourself to. The first is to let this acceptance that's beginning to begin in you, let it expand. Let yourself understand beyond reason that totally awful, crazy stuff happens, but has its own reasons, which will only be revealed slowly. They're not revealed fast, but they are revealed to those who are surrendered. You'll find that out. So surrender, accept. Although, wait, wait. wait. Wait, hold on, he's not done. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Andrew. The second thing is to really deepen your spiritual practice. When you are in dreadful circumstances, there's always the temptation to rage at God. But actually, the dreadful circumstances are designed to help you go deeper into your love for God. So practice the name of God, practice deeply, and you'll find that you'll be given subtle experiences, subtle revelations, subtle understandings, new strength, new patience, new force. And thirdly, you have to, I'll tell you a story about a great friend of mine. My greatest friend in many ways in life was Gloria Vanderbilt. I happened to know Gloria for 20 years, very intimately. And when I first met her, she had just suffered the most horrible thing that could happen to a mother. Her son had committed suicide by leaping off a balcony in front of her. It was terrifying. So tragic. Oh, so tragic. Yeah. And Gloria, I was saying, I was talking to Gloria about what she had gone through. And she, I said, um, what did this bring to you? And she said, why wouldn't it happen to me? Why would 
tragedy not happened to Gloria Vanderbilt, it happens to everybody else, why would I be exempt? And when she said that, I realized she had, instead of complaining about what had happened to her, the horror of what had happened to her, she'd used what had happened to her to become so much more aware of the pain and the suffering that everyone is going through. So your opportunity now is to expand your heart to embrace all those who are going through the agony of the world. That is the birth of divine compassion in your heart. So deepen the acceptance. Let the acceptance reveal the surrender and let the surrender reveal the mystery of what you're in. Practice deeply, stay in love with love through practice and you'll be elevated and ennobled. And thirdly, use the pain as a way of giving up any idea of being special. Why should you be exempt from pain? Why should I? Why should Jen? None of us are. This is part of the mystery of being born here. And you'll find that the most horrible of experiences will become the springboard for a new, richer, stranger, deeper, more compassionate life. And I just want to thank you for sharing the story about your your experience with your friend who passed because um, I, I I need I need I need to keep believing that my son lives on. Of course he does. And there's a I was going to suggest to you something. I had the honor of working with the great Tibetan masters on a book called The Book of the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. And these great beings who had been through death many times to come back to help would describe the whole process of death. The Dalai Lama asked me to write this book and it's become a world book. It's gone all over the world. And you'll find, I beg you to read it. It's called Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. And it was a, a a Tibetan master called Sogyal Rinpoche, S-O-G-Y-A-L. And there are practices towards the end of how to keep praying for your dead mm-hmm. son. For Keep in communion, keep speaking, keep loving. He's in another room. He's not dead. There's no death. There's the death of the body. He's in another room, but you can still, as his mother, pray for him. Pray for his well-being. Pray, offer up for him. And you'll find that once you open those channels by belief, you'll get dreams. You'll have signs. You real- So start that work. <clears throat> it will change your life because it's changed mine because what happened with Bede and also what happened with my father. After my father's death, I've been in much deeper relationship with him than I was even when he was alive. He's become inside me love never dies and your love for your son is an eternal love his love for you is an eternal love he's alive in in life in another realm just keep speaking to him and praying for him and loving him and sending him wonderful wonderful messages and encouraging him to go forward into the education of the soul that he's getting and you receive peace yourself, but you'll also, over time, you'll find that you'll receive messages which will show that what I'm saying is true. Have faith. Thank you. That's awesome. And education of the soul. Um, I love that saying, education of the soul. We have just a couple minutes left, and I want to get to Ruthie's question. Ruthie, you had a question for Andrew? Ruthie, um, hello. It's so nice to listen to you tonight. It was just what I needed tonight, and I so appreciate everything you said. Um, one thing that I am always confused about, um, listening to Andy's question and then your response is, is trying to figure out where or how to, um, I don't even know how to say it, um, not shut people out because you disagree with them, but have some sort of a safe boundary so that they're not torturing you. I mean, oh, yes. <laughs> when you fundamentally disagree, um, but you still want to 
show compassion for this person and love this person, how do you do that when you find what they're saying almost amoral? I mean, how do you how do you balance that? I'm totally lost. Well, first, establishing boundaries are part of being an adult. And I think you're a woman of deep savvy, so you know how to protect yourself. And if, if you want a protection practice, that's a very good thing to have these days when you're in this crazy atmosphere. Just imagine white light all around you, protecting you from any dark or polluting influences. I often do this, just Christ above me. It doesn't matter what name, light, white light, white light, white light, white light, everywhere. So you feel protected. That's the first thing. The second thing, and this is going to demand something of you, but I think you're up for it. Look, look, I'm going to ask a question and I'm going to try and answer it. How does the Dalai Lama still have so much compassion for the Chinese who have destroyed his world, killed a third of his people, ruined the monasteries, and keep torturing the Tibetans. How does he do this? I, I asked him that. I've, I've asked, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> he has compassion because he understands at a fundamental level that what they have done to his people has is potentially breeding terrible dark karma for them and closing them off from authentic realization, from authentic revelation. So when these people say terrible things that you think are amoral, instead of reacting to their amorality, take a step back and see that what's happening is that they are digging a hole for themselves karmically, they're removing themselves from grace. They're believing violent illusions. And this is tragic for them. This is going to wound and destroy and limit and narrow them in terrible ways. That when you see it spiritually, your heart breaks for them. So you don't have to judge them, that's not going to help. What will help is you realizing that by doing what they're doing, they're creating a very difficult karmic situation for themselves. And that will make you compassionate for them. And that will make you really pray for them that they will receive light to go forward in a way that's whole and sane. Very important shift. Mm. Does that make sense, Rafi? It does for the people that I already know and hold dear who I disagree with. I mean, I think it's easier to do when you have a little bit of history, but when you meet that new person who strikes up a conversation and just pushes every button you've got, it's really hard to hold back and to say, it is hard, but that's where the practice comes in. Because the more you practice, the more you're able to approach everybody with the same kind of compassion and love. It's not a question of history or not. It's a question of being given the direct perception into the state of the person in front of you and then doing whatever you can to relate to that person with grace. And sometimes you can't do it, but you can always relate to them without demonizing them. So protect yourself with, and with cultivate this more impersonal compassion mm -hmm. that understands that when people are involved in terrible opinions, they're not affecting your opinions. You know that it's craziness. What they're doing is digging a ditch for themselves and that's a tragic thing. So you can have compassion for them. And very strangely, when you approach people in that way, Sometimes very subtle shifts take place, which enables light to come through. Right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because you say if they're people you don't know, Ruthie, then you know it's almost like 
when you're watching a, a, like for me, a soccer game, I don't care who wins a soccer game. I don't have much passion about soccer. It's not my thing. It's sort of just observational. So if they're just new acquaintances, they're not immediate family or people that are close to your heart, friends for decades. It's almost like, ah, thank you for showing me how I don't want to be. Thank you for being my teacher. You know, it's, it's like an observational rather than something you take personally. Right. Does that make sense? And it's also every time, in a sense, if you're training for the divine life, you're training to be somebody who is there for everyone, who is loving everyone. And you're training to be someone who, whose buttons aren't pushed by crazy people. Because you know the world's a lunatic asylum. You know you're crazy. Of course, you love your own craziness, but you're... A, an awake being is someone who is sane in a global lunatic asylum. So you're always meeting people who are mad in different ways, who need different forms of compassion and concern and respect. That's the truth of life. So don't, every time you get your buttons pushed, realize you've got to work on your buttons. Right. It's a, it, I, be, I appreciate the shift in perspective. It's so oh, important. Especially now. Thank you. Well, if you, don't, if you don't know now that this world is a lunatic asylum and you're in the asylum locked in with some very dangerous people, you're not seeing reality. And if you know anything about dangerous people, you know that the only thing that ever works with dangerous people is kindness. Is, and I'll tell you, I'll give you a story. I, was, I was, gave a party in Paris when I lived in Paris. And there was a guy there who'd been brought by a friend of mine. And he said, can I stay on and have a drink with you? You're such an interesting guy. And I said, of course, stay. I'd love to have a drink with you. So we, had a, we were chatting. And then suddenly he went psychotic. And he took out a knife, locked the door. And he said, I'm going to kill you. And I was locked in that room for eight hours with somebody who was psychotic. And I understood something overwhelming in those eight hours. I understood that if I manifested any kind of aggression, he would use that as an excuse to kill me. So if I put him down or humiliated him or showed fear or aggression, I'd be dead. And I I knew that. So what happened was that I went into deep peace deep calm, and I prayed to be able to see him, this being who was threatening my life, I to see him as he really was, so lonely, so desperate, so crazy. And I swear to you that I just got calm and I radiated mm-hmm. love towards him. I radiated kindness and I spoke gently. And I just refused to get scared or aggressive. And about six, you know, at the end of the night, when the dawn came on, he said, I'm not going to kill you. You're a nice guy and left. But I learned a huge amount through that about how to approach desperate, mad people. Mm. And it's by it's by kindness, because that's what they're truly looking for underneath. And that's what we're all looking for is that voice of, of respect. Well, Scott, Scott well. just joined us from the, from the West Coast uh, because he had the time change. He thought it was- uh, nice Andrew, hello, my dear beloved brother. I screwed up. I was thinking five to seven Pacific time. That's what I put on my calendar. Oh, you arrived at the end like Merlin. This is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can even, it, since you drew the Merlin thing, I can even put on my Merlin cap that is perfect. Get out my magic wand. That is perfect. And, uh, That's try and change the need. time here. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Scott, you said you were hosting another online event. What was your event that you were hosting? Um, I hosted two today, actually. Every morning, I, every Sunday, I do a show called Sacred Sundays. Mm-hmm. And we had Lynn McTaggart uh, on. And we were doing a whole visioning for this upcoming solstice. Yeah. And then uh, from one o'clock to five o'clock, which just ended, I told them we have to be done by five because I've got to get to Andrew Harvey. Um, <laughs> I was hosting a, a rainbow gathering online with Fantuzzi and kind of a lot of magicians and, uh, not magicians, musicians. 
And so literally, we just ended at five so I could come be with Andrew. Oh, so, well, lucky for you, Scott, you we recorded the whole thing. So we'll send it to you because, of course, Andrew was amazing. And so was our gallery. And so I want to thank everybody. I'm so sorry, Scott, you're just coming in as we're, as we're stepping up. But I will send the link to Scott so we can see that. Scott, do you have a question before we wrap up? Even though you might have had it asked already, but if I'm guessing you would ask just the right thing. Is there something you want to ask Andrew? Um, gosh, you know, I guess the only thing is just privately, Andrew, I would love to still... Uh, do oh, a special yes. show with you and the book. Sure. I'd love to do something on radical regeneration for you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, in so ju January, we'll do it. Okay. We'll need to do it then. That's yeah. right, because as we the shift is coming up, and I'm sure you were just talking about it, Scott. So today and tomorrow, very, very big energetic shifts. So be with good people that surround you, that make you feel joyful, that don't deplete you, that don't um, rob your energy flow, and that aren't toxic. Be sure to keep up those boundaries, as Andrew talked about, bringing in the light and really staying centered and grounded and breathing in God into your heart. And especially on the full moon and the 29th and the 30th, take a salt bath, shed anything that no longer works for you or serves for you and put out there with your thoughts every night of all those wonderful things you see yourself doing and, and in service and as you do your radical regeneration and you think about how you want to be a sacred activist um, always go to andrewharvey.net we can plan our trips for 2021 i've got one in the fall in europe and andrew's got several going to India and all sorts of things. So check on his website, check on my website at jenweigel.com. Um, more spiritual social clubs coming up, but I'm just so grateful, Andrew Harvey. Thank you for your expertise, for your no, wisdom, no, no. for all no, your thank work. Thank you for letting me have the chance to meet such lovely people. God bless you, Kim. My heart is with you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Ruthie. Thank you, Cha Cha Choro. I didn't hear from you. I loved the name itself and your face will live with me. And God bless you. Thank you. Thank you too, dear, dear Jen. Thank God you so you. much. God bless all of you. Stay healthy, happy, and we will see you all very soon. Thank you for all of your time and energy. Bless Blessings you. and happiest of holidays to all of you. Happy Christmas, everybody. God happy bless you. Christmas.